This is the MiG-15, one of the most lethal, groundbreaking, and feared fighters in history. It was one of the first combat jet fighters that saw undeniable success in the air and an aircraft that truly changed dogfighting forever. In this video, we will look at the MiG-15 and specifically five fascinating facts that you likely never knew about this famous fighter. This is the MiG-15, and before we get into five fascinating details about this famous dogfighter, I'd like to give a thank you to the sponsor that helped make this video possible, Masterworks. In case you don't know, Masterworks is a new way to invest in the time-proven market of fine art. Right now, as inflation is hitting markets, typically one of the best places that top investors have looked to diversify their money is actually fine art. Historically, however, this has only been doable for those with massive budgets, but not anymore. Thanks to Masterworks, you now can invest in the biggest names in art like Picasso and Monet by buying shares of their famous artwork, just like shares of a stock. And then, when Masterworks sells a piece of art, you get a portion of their potential returns. And their track record is looking pretty good. In the last year, they have exited nine investments with some absolutely fantastic returns. I have been investing on Masterworks myself since January of 2022, and I absolutely love their platform. So skip the waitlist and join Masterworks, and it supports TJ3 history. Use the link in the description below to start investing in fine art today. Thanks again to Masterworks, and now enjoy. The year is 1950. The Korean War has just begun. And you, an American pilot, are flying over Korean soil, trying to help defend this nation along with United Nations allies. In your advanced F-86 Sabre, you own the skies. That is, until a new and unexpected adversary appears, the Soviet-made MiG-15. The MiG-15 was justifiably considered to be a superior airplane to the F-86 primarily because it's of its stability issues at high speed. It's, it's just a classic example of an advance in technology um, that kind of caught the Americans a little bit by surprise. I mean, the MiG-15 was a bit of a surprise to us um, when it was first deployed and how we had to scramble to catch up. This modern opponent is unlike anything that you have had to face before. Faster, more agile, and more heavily armed. In the back of your mind, you wonder, how is this possible? How is it that a nation that was so far behind in World War II could have possibly made such a brilliant leap in such a short amount of time? After all, the Soviet Union only survived the previous war because we, the United States, supplied them with an unbelievable number of American-made planes, since they were not able to keep up with production and the advances in technology on their own. It simply doesn't seem to make sense. And you would be, in truth, correct in this assessment. Which brings us to our first fact in this video. The copied, or even stolen designs, that played a huge role in the MiG-15. Now, this fact is not a clear-cut piece of history, but it is subject to some debate. To start with, we can look at the engine, as this is the most obvious part of the design that was undoubtedly taken from other designers. Originally, when the first models of the MiG-15 took to the air, they used an engine that was taken and reverse-engineered from German aircraft, the BMW 003 turbojet. And while this design was usable, the Soviets learned quickly, like the Germans, that this design had trouble getting the horsepower that was needed to power a single-engine fighter. So, the MiG-15 needed a new engine. But where would they get it? They were nowhere near this level of technology with their own research. Fortunately, however, two of Joseph Stalin's top advisors put forth an outlandish idea. What if the USSR simply bought the fully developed jet engines that the British had just unveiled? Joseph Stalin reportedly replied to this by saying, What fool would sell us his secrets? Luckily for him, that fool would be the British. 
The Labour government of the United Kingdom had just recently made it clear that they were looking to improve public perception of their relationship with the Soviets shortly after World War II. Stalin and his advisors jumped on this opportunity and offered to buy their new Rolls-Royce jet engine designs. Shockingly, the Brits agreed, and within a few months, the MiG-15 had a fully operational engine that provided all of the thrust needed to be a formidable fighter. In terms of the engines, the Russians had a very advanced airframe that they had designed with the MiG-15, but they didn't have an engine that could power it. The British at that point in time were the preeminent um, makers of jet engines. They also were strapped for cash. So the Russians kind of wooed the British into saying, you know, will you sell us, will you sell us a, a, an engine? We promise not to copy it or anything. We just want to learn the technology. Or, or actually the British would hope, was hoping that they would license the technology and pay the British. Well, they got, the, the Russians got a hold of an engine and copied it. So the engine in, the engine in, in the MiG-15 was basically an out-and-out -out copy of the Rolls-Royce Dean engine, which was a very, very good engine, by the way. In addition to the engines, however, there were some other aspects of the MiG-15 that were likely taken from the designs of other nations in less obvious ways. As we will see, these cases are not as clear-cut as that of the engines. Because of this, there is a substantial amount of disagreement on many of these aspects among historians. In fact, you can go onto the Smithsonian website and look at the page for the MiG-15, and here it says very clearly, Although Mikoyan and Gurevich were aware of German turbojet and swept-wing work, the design was wholly Russian, except for the engine. This is a fair assessment, but let's take a look at the German work being referred to here. First, here is the final project of the Messerschmitt organization in World War II. This would be the P-1101. This cutting-edge design was put forth as part of the emergency fighter project that Germany had announced late in the war. The design was very unique, especially compared to any of the other jets that saw action in World War II, as it had a single engine, swept wings, and was much smaller in size and weight. When looking at the 1101, it is no perfect match, but it does have some striking similarities to that of the MiG-15. One of the problems with linking these two planes together, however, is that at the end of the war, the Americans actually captured these designs instead of the Soviets. In fact, the prototype that was being built in May of 1945 actually became a popular spot for American GIs to take photos after the Germans surrendered. Thus, it seems difficult to correlate this design as the inspiration behind the MiG-15, as the Soviets had limited access to its prototype, designs, and plans. But let me introduce you to the winning design of Hitler's emergency fighter project, the Focke-Wulf TA-183. This prototype was designed by famed aviation pioneer Kurt Tunk. Now, let's look. What does this plane have an even more striking resemblance to? especially when you look at the subtle details like the elevated horizontal stabilizer on the tail structure. And while the TA-183 never made it past the design stage, it did advance to models and wind tunnel tests before the end of the war. And guess who captured these wind tunnels and models in May of 1945? None other than the advancing forces of the Soviet Union. So the MiG-15 bears a very, very close resemblance to a wind tunnel model and wind tunnel data from the TA-183, which was a design by Kurt Tonk, who designed the Focke Wolf 190 and the, the TA-152, um, and was a very advanced designer. If you look at the wind tunnel model, we have a picture of it on the panel in front of the MiG. If you look at the wind tunnel model, um, it, it bears a very, very close resemblance. So it's entirely possible, uh, in, in fact, very likely, that the Russians used that as a starting point for designing uh, the airframe. And again, this is subject to debate. Russian aviation historian Yefim Gordon refutes any connection to the T-8183 and the MiG-15 and insists that the MiG-15 was an original design. 
but in my humble opinion, it obviously, at a minimum, provided substantial inspiration. And it is undeniable that the Soviet MiG-15 was essentially the combination of influences and ideas from various designers, both domestic and abroad. Up next, we will look at a major role that the Americans played in the first combat of the MiG-15. This, however, would not be a role in the aircraft itself, but the pilots. As the war in Korea came about in 1950, the United Nations were supporting the South Koreans, and the Soviet Union and Chinese supported the North. This new conflict placed many former allies in a now tense relationship. The Soviet Union had supplied the North Koreans with the new MiG-15 to devastating effect. It wreaked havoc on many American aircraft in the first years of the war, but one of the key questions was, who was flying these fighters? The North Koreans did in fact have a handful of pilots themselves, but they were mostly trained in piston engine fighters and were not yet ready for jet combat. But there were multiple MiG-15s that were now flying into combat with North Korean markings. It was a perplexing question, and eventually, many years later, it would become known that the USSR supplied North Korea with pilots for their MiGs. In order to hide this, they actually went as far as dressing these pilots in North Korean uniforms or civilian clothes to try and hide their origins. And while this is quite interesting, the other fascinating story is the third party of MiG pilots that joined the fray, the Chinese. China joined the Korean War in support of North Korea early on, and when they did, they too had an arsenal of Soviet MiG-15s. But they, unlike the North Koreans, did have some true jet-capable pilots. But why exactly did they have these highly trained pilots? Well, in large part, this was thanks to the United States. We began training uh, Chinese pilots for World War II uh, pretty early on. Uh, and some of them even came to places like uh, Arizona to learn how to be pilots. In, in early World War II, when the Japanese were invading uh, China, took over the coast all the way down into Southeast Asia, the, the, it was very difficult to train Chinese in their own country because of the fact there was an active war going on and, uh, and that you know, having access to the appropriate airplanes to train in was a real problem too. So consequently, quite a few Chinese came here to Arizona. And, uh, and then they set up training programs later on out in, uh, in China when the Flying Tigers first got to China as the, as the American volunteer group. Uh, they expanded right after the Pearl Harbor attack you know, into a, a, a composite wing with the Chinese. And at this point, training uh, Americans and Chinese in fighter aircraft and in transport aircraft, and that, uh, you know, that pipeline was going continuously. So it's interesting to me in respect to the MiG-15 later in North Korea, that a lot of the foundation of that uh, aviation capability uh, you know, had its beginning in World War II with the Americans' help. And would eventually be used against the Americans, yes. right? Yes. Well, because the Americans were part of the United Nations forces that were technically overseeing uh, the Korean War. These Chinese pilots, outfitted with Soviet aircraft and trained in large part by the Americans, would play a significant role in this battle fighting against the very nation that in many cases trained them to fly. At number three in today's list, we will look at one of the top design priorities behind the MiG-15. And it might not be what you think. Although the MiG-15 would undoubtedly be a great dogfighter, it was actually designed primarily with another role in mind, to hunt and destroy heavy bombers. The reason that this became such a high priority for aircraft designers in the late 1940s and early 50s was attributed to the fact that in World War II, the heavy bombers in many ways won the war. In both Japan and Germany, American B-24s, B-17s, and B-29s pounded the Axis powers into eventual submission. 
It became clear after the war that these high-altitude bombers would be a formidable weapon in the future, and so a major priority would have to be to neutralize these threats. The MiG-15 was thus designed not only with a powerful weapon, but also with the capability to fly extremely fast and at the high altitudes necessary to shoot down these enemy bombers. When these designs were finally put to the test and the MiG-15 took on the B-29 over Korea, it shot down the American aircraft at an alarming pace. Many crews were lost because of how quickly the MiG-15 could reach the formations and how ineffective the B-29's defensive gunners were. These daytime raids were ceased early on in Korea as the rate of losses could not be sustained by the U.S. Air Force, showing just how deadly the MiG-15 was as a bomber killer. At number two, we will look at one of the most mind-blowing facts on the MiG-15 its unbelievable service tenure. When looking at the MiG, there are many ways to arrive at the conclusion that it was a groundbreaking and effective aircraft. But perhaps the most effective way to showcase this is to simply look at how long the MiG has been a service aircraft in militaries around the world. Designed in the years immediately following World War II, the MiG-15 would first see combat in the Chinese Civil War. In fact, the first aerial kills that were ever recorded for this fighter were here against a Chinese nationalist P-38 on April 28th of 1950, and then another Chinese B-24 Liberator a few weeks later on May 11th. This would be the start of a very long service life. For the remainder of the 1950s, the MiG-15 would see a variety of usage in nations across the globe, primarily of course with the Soviet Union. In addition to the Korean War, it would see use in the Cold War, the Suez Canal Crisis, and the Taiwan Strait Crisis in the late 1950s. By the time we arrived at the Vietnam War in the late 1960s, the MiG-15 had been largely replaced by what was an essentially an updated model the MiG-17. However, the MiG-15 did not see the end of its service life there. The original aircraft proved to be so well designed that it was used by a trainer in a long list of countries, as it was an ideal way to transition young pilots into more advanced jet fighters. It worked so well in this role that even today, in 2023, the MiG-15 is still being used as a trainer in the North Korean Air Force. It is simply fascinating to think that an aircraft whose first combat kill was a P-38 is still being used to train pilots more than seven decades later, placing the overall service life of the MiG-15 at a total of more than 70 years. Finally, at number one, we have a top secret mission that was ordered by the United States that involves the MiG-15. This would be Operation Moolah. As the Korean War waged, it became the general consensus among pilots that the MiG-15 was superior to any United Nations jets at the time. Thus, the United States desperately needed to get their hands on this new aircraft to determine what exactly made it such a deadly adversary. The United States um, fortunately came upon a crashed Zero in Alaska and learned a great deal about the Zero, which helped them develop tactics uh, to deal with the Zero. So having in your possession, a, especially a flyable aircraft, allows you to develop tactics by flying the aircraft and finding out what its performance is, rather than you know, going on rumors. The, the United States knew what engine it had in it because it was a British engine um, that, was, that, that, that was basically copied by the Soviets. I think it was more, what are its operational characteristics so that we can develop tactics to deal with it, both now and in the future. In 1950, a plan was formed. This plan, dubbed appropriately Operation Moolah, would offer a cash reward of $100,000, or roughly $1 million today, for the first pilot to defect from a communist nation and bring a MiG-15 into South Korea. As a reward, it would also see the pilot relocated into a non-communist nation and retain their anonymity. 
This plan was thought to have a high probability of success, as the U.S. already had intel that led them to believe that there were a high number of disgruntled pilots within the ranks of these communist nations. As soon as Operation Moolah was given the green light, American B-29s flying at night dropped over a million leaflets into communist bases throughout North Korea. These were in Russian, Chinese, and Korean, and gave details of the offer for the MiG-15. In addition to a possible intel breakthrough, this plan had the potential to create a propaganda goldmine for the United States. If they were able to get a pilot to defect, they would also be able to broadcast the fact that a communist pilot had defected from the tyranny of their country to pursue the freedom in South Korea. It was a brilliant idea. The success of the plan would actually be debatable in the end, however, because shortly after it was approved in March of 1953, an armistice would be signed just four months later, ending the Korean War. The leaflets themselves, however, may have played a substantial role on their own. It was noted by many U.S. fighter pilots that very shortly after the leaflets were dropped, the quality of communist pilots in MiG-15s decreased substantially, with many of them even bailing out at the sights of American aircraft. Eventually, however, a handful of defectors would still arrive in South Korea. In September of that year, the first and most notable would arrive, a North Korean pilot by the name of No Kum Suk. He successfully landed at Kempo Air Base in South Korea, but upon landing after he was interrogated, it was actually realized that he was completely unaware of Operation Moolah. He gladly cooperated nonetheless. After the MiG-15 was captured, it was taken to the United States for testing and would be flown by famous test pilot and aviator Chuck Yeager. In these tests, it was found to be an effective fighter, but still had plenty of shortcomings. Major Jaeger was later quoted with saying, Flying the MiG-15 is the most demanding situation that I have ever faced. It is a quirky airplane that has killed a lot of its pilots. It was determined that based on this testing, the aspect that played the greatest role in aerial combat over Korea was pilot experience and training. Jaeger famously said in regards to this, the pilot with the most experience will whoop your ass no matter what you're flying. Because of his defection, No would later learn that five of his fellow pilots, including his best friend, were executed by firing squad. The United States, following the orders of President Eisenhower, instead of offering a cash reward, offered No asylum and paid full tuition at an American university. He would graduate as an engineer and would work for many American aviation companies. He recently passed away in December of 2022. The incredible clips that you guys saw in this video of the planes and interviews from experts were taken here in Air Base Arizona, run by the Commemorative Air Force. This has one of the coolest displays of combat aircraft that you've ever seen, and I would very much encourage you guys to come out here and check it out. Please comment on what plane I should cover next and please consider subscribing.